morning and welcome. Let's all stand together. You know it, let's sing it out. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of love, O kings. Who shakes the thank you for your unwavering sacrifice that you died in our place that we can have eternal life. God, we thank you for that and we glorify and we praise you and we lift you up for no other reason, God, but because you are worthy this morning. I ask you, Lord, to be among us. Uh, let us open our hearts, God, to be able to let you speak. And God, we thank you and we love you just for the opportunity that we have to gather here freely today in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I hear the 
Set free. 
As our men come, we prepare to worship in our giving. Would you bow with me in just a moment of prayer? Father, thank you for your goodness. <clears throat> and um, it is true that uh, your mercy does uh, rain on us like a flood. And you pour out your grace. In fact, your word says that your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And we can say and testify this morning that you have been faithful to your people. And so, God, I, I pray today that um, as we give, that it, it would be with a heart of worship and gratitude and just a, a thank you for your faithfulness and that you would use what it is that we give for the advancement of your kingdom and the glory of your great name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. For me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, I still will follow, though none go with me, I still will follow.
Well, good morning, everyone. If you have a Bible, uh, take it out and turn in it to the book of Psalms and go to Psalm 95. Not Psalms 95, but Psalm 95. You say, why are you making such a big deal of that? I really don't know. It just bothers me. (laughs) So just um, Psalm 95. There are a lot of psalms in the book of Psalms that deal and talk about the idea uh, and mention the idea of thanksgiving. And um, with thanksgiving approaching, I wanted to take a psalm that mentioned the idea about thanksgiving and give you today a psalm for thanksgiving. Now, um, so what I did was basically just Um, find a psalm randomly uh, with a little bit of prayer uh, that mentioned thanksgiving, and then I began to study this out, and uh, I think it is a really, really important word from God to us, because we find in Psalm 95 this invitation, but also this warning that God gives us in his word about how it is we approach and respond to him. Now, I don't know if you have heard about the five-year-old who had one of those days that was just kind of full of trouble, just couldn't get, you know, her and her parents didn't gee and ha, as they say. Just one of those days where she seemed to always get in trouble, he seemed to always get in trouble, and just couldn't do anything right. And finally, the mother said, "Um, listen, sit down, just sit down. And the child didn't, didn't move, and the mother said, I said, sit down. The child just stood there. You ever had one of those kids? And then so the mother took the child by the shoulders, and sat the child down and said, I said, sit down and don't get up until I say. The mother walks away, and in just a moment, you hear the child call out and say, I'm sitting down on the outside, <laughs> but then on the inside, I'm standing. <laughs> um, I think all of us can, uh, if you're a parent, obviously all of us identify with the parent, to some degree, but I think all of us can actually identify with the child as well, because I think all of us have a little bit of standing up on the inside attitude. Like, I don't want people to tell me what to do, or if I don't want, feel like it, I'm not going to do it, and it could be, you know, you have this attitude toward a boss, uh, you just, whatever this person says, I know they're my boss. I know that I ought to be doing what they say. I'm obligated to do what they say, but I just, I just don't want to. I just don't want to do it. It could be toward a parent. Um, it could be toward a spouse. They give you, they're never telling you what to do necessarily, maybe, but they're giving you some advice. And you're just like, I just, I don't want to do it. In fact, I think that some of us, And I know that I find myself in this category sometimes um, because I I have a bad heart without the Lord and the Spirit, but I just find myself sometimes not wanting to do it just because everybody else wants me to do it. Does anybody identify with that? Okay. They want, you want me to do it and I just don't want to do it because I don't want to do it. And so I'm not going to do it just... Maybe because you don't want me to do it. I think it's just this, we have in us a little bit of a defiant spirit. Maybe a lot a bit of a defiant spirit. Now, this is true in these different areas of life, relationships at work or at home or whatever. Um, But I think this is also true and maybe especially true in the spiritual realm. I believe that we know many times what God wants us to do, 
but we just don't do it. Maybe because we don't want to do it, but we just don't do it. And sometimes we don't even have a reason why it is we don't do what God wants us to do. We just don't do it. And I think the main reason is that we are resisting because we have a little bit or a lot of bit of a rebellious, defiant spirit toward God. And I think where this comes from many times is this desire for us to have autonomy. Autonomy is, a, is really two Greek words put together that means self-rule. We like to govern ourselves. We want to make our decisions and do our thing, and we want to live life our way. And so we want to be autonomous. We don't we, don't, we want to rule ourselves. We don't want anybody else to be able to tell us what to do. I mean, that's part of actually the American dream, isn't it? Is to be able to do what we want, when we want, how we want, with whom we want, and have the money to pay for it. Okay, that's what we want. Okay? And so we call it autonomy. I get to rule myself. But listen, sometimes if you think about it, and I don't think I'm overstating this, But God calls it a hard heart. God calls it, the Bible calls it a hard heart. And that is really the idea behind Psalm 95. Psalm 95 has two sections. The first section is an invitation from the psalmist who the book of Hebrews, we believe, the book of Hebrews says is David, even though it's not Uh, written here in Psalm 95, the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews said David was the one who wrote this. But this, the first section is an invitation that invites the people of God to worship God. And the second section warns them about a past event in Israel's history where Israel's hearts became hardened toward God. And here's kind of the main thing I want to get across today, the thing I want to leave you with and kind of flesh out a little bit. And it's really a question that I want all of us to ask ourselves and think about as we look through this psalm and maybe as we leave today. And here's the question I want to leave with you to get you thinking about. When God calls you, calls to you, when God speaks to you, how does your heart respond? What is the disposition of your heart when God speaks to you? Now, let's look at Psalm 95. First of all, there's an invitation the psalmist gives us to worship. An invitation to worship. Look what it says in verse 1. Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with Thanksgiving. There's where the Thanksgiving theme comes in, right there. Let us enter into his presence with Thanksgiving. Did you know that Thanksgiving, like giving of thanks, gratitude, is a key characteristic of a Christian? Because God has done so much for you that you respond with an attitude of gratitude, if you will. That you are just thankful to the Lord. And the invitation from the psalmist is let us enter into his presence with thanksgiving. When you come into the presence of God to worship, is thanksgiving part of the attitude that you have? Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. Now, all of these uh, things here are um, what's written in the Hebrew as indirect commands. In other words, it's not somebody telling somebody to necessarily do something and like like an authority figure standing and saying you must go do this but it really is expressing a desire that people do this and it includes even the writer himself inviting the people of God to worship God now he gives two reasons here the first one is that We worship God, and the invitation to worship God is because he is the God. Look in verse number three. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand. The mountain peaks are his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands formed the dry land. 
You see, there may be many so-called, so-called gods, but notice here that the Lord is the great God. Now, it's interesting and important to understand that when he says there, and, and this is going to help some of you, that notice in verse 3 where it says the Lord, what's unique about that word Lord is that it's in all capital letters. So in the Old Testament, many of you know this, whenever you see the word Lord in all capital letters or the word God in all capital letters, what you have there is not just a generic name for God, but you have God's personal name. We would know it as Yahweh or Jehovah. And the reason this is important is because the word God is a generic term that is used in the Old Testament for God himself, but also for angels, other spiritual beings, and other gods. Okay, so because in the Old Testament there is a, I mean, just rampant polytheism, meaning that people believed in many gods. And so they can talk about God and gods all they want. In fact, uh, where it says above all gods in verse number three, above all gods, the word gods there is the same word used for God in Genesis 1 when God created the heavens and the earth. So the context determines. But why, what is important about this is that the writer of Psalms, of this psalm, is saying that the Lord, the personal name of God, our God, is the great God. He is the one who is above all other gods. He is, and what he's saying there, in essence, is, is he is the God. He's the only God. There may be so many other gods or so-called gods, but the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Christian God, is the king above all these other gods. There may be other gods, but listen, he rules over all of these. Now, there are no other gods, but in people's minds, there may be other gods. That's his point. Okay, so there's not any, there are no other gods. Okay, and so his point is, is that God is not one of many. God is the one and only. He is the creator, he says. The whole creation belongs to him and was made by him. Even the depths, it says, are in his hand. Now, the depths is a word that means an unexplored range. So what he's saying there is even the furthest, untouched places of the earth are in the hand of God. The places that people have never made it to and never will are in the palm of God. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans that the fundamental sin of humanity is a lack of worship for God. If you want to turn there, go to Romans chapter 1. If you don't want to turn there, go to Romans... No, I'm kidding. But look at Romans 1, verse number 18. It's going to be on the screen if you don't have a Bible or don't want to turn there. Romans 1, 18. The fundamental sin of humanity. Listen, the fundamental, the basic sin of humanity is that they neglected to worship God. Listen to what he says. Verse 18. For, the, for God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of, unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. By the way, did you know, did you know that it's not that people don't know the truth, it's that they suppress it. They, they push it down so as it not to make any difference or have any authority in their lives. It's not that they don't know it or can't know it. It's that they don't want to know it. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. Wait a minute. You're saying that we can know about God? Like, like it's evident among us? How is it evident among us? Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, the things about God that you can't see, that is, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world. Look, being understood through what he has made. You can look. How do you know that there is a builder of a building? 
The building, right? How do you know that there is a painter? The painting. How do you know there is a creator? The creation. The creation is evidence there was and is a creator. Now, look what happens here. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. What was their problem? Their problem was is that they knew God was there. They knew that he was powerful, creative, that he was good, all by the creation, and they chose instead not to glorify him as God. They chose instead not to worship him or to be thankful, an expression of worship. This is the fundamental, the fundamental sin of humanity is a rejection and a refusal to worship God. God reveals who he is through creation, that he is worthy of worship, but humanity has chosen not to give him that worship. A profound level of ingratitude toward the one who created us, by the way. When you and I do not worship God, it is a profound level of ingratitude to the God who created us. You hear what I'm saying? We worship God because he is the God. But the second reason the psalmist gives is we worship God and invited to worship him, not just because he's the God, but because he is our God. Look in verse number six. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. The image is of God as a shepherd, which is a common theme in the Old Testament. I think about what psalm do you think about when you think about Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my what? Shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And we, that by implication there, we are his sheep. We are um, the sheep of his pasture. His, really, the, he says the people of his pasture, which is kind of like mixing metaphors there. We're his people, but we're also his sheep in his pasture, the people of his pasture, that we are his sheep. And this speaks not just of God revealing himself to us, but actually relating to us. Uh, catch that. Because he's not just talking about God revealing himself as all-powerful and creative and good, but it's talking about God relating to us. The creator God decided to come down and relate to you and me. There was a relationship there. We follow him. We depend on him. He provides. He cares. He leads. He protects. He corrects our waywardness. Psalm 23, as I said, is a good parallel here. That he's walking, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There is a relationship there. If the fundamental sin of humanity is a failure to worship God and be thankful to him, then one of the characteristics of redemption is our worship and thanksgiving to the God who saved us. Can I say that again? That's one of the characteristics of redemption. Worship. Worship. Now, this brings up an important question. I hope you're still with me. I'm trying to keep you engaged here. This brings up a really important question. What is worship? What is worship? Well, pastor, that's the time that we have before the preaching. Or that's the, uh, we say in East Tennessee, we say it, not the singing, but the singing. That's the singing. Some of you who are not from East Tennessee are like, what is he talking about? <laughs> what, is, what is worship? Is it the music? Is it, what is worship? Well, it actually, we see it in the psalm. We see it in the verse here. Look in verse 6. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. 
The word worship is the word shaka in Hebrew, and it literally means to prostrate yourself, to bow down, and to just lay before God. He mentions bow down. He mentions the idea of kneeling before God. And in fact, in the New Testament, the word worship in the New Testament literally means to bow down as well. So what is worship? Worship is not the music that you listen to. It's not a style of music you listen to. It's not the time of music that you have before the preaching. It's not anything else other than a bowing before the Lord. That's worship. Is everybody following what I'm saying? Specifically, it is a bowing of your heart before God. It's a heart thing. Did you know that you can sing and your heart not be bowed before God? And if you're doing it, you're not worshiping. You can listen to the preaching, but if your heart is not bowed before the Lord in submission and surrender, you're not worshiping. If you come to church and you do not have a heart bowed before the Lord in submission and surrender, you did not come to worship. You might have come to church, but you didn't come to worship. Because worship is specifically a bowing of your heart before God. It is a deference, a submission, a surrender to God. Now here's the question I'm asking you this morning. When God calls you how does your heart respond? Does it respond in submission and surrender to the God who calls? Now what the psalmist does, and the reason I ask this, is because the psalmist brings up an event in Israel's past where they responded not with a soft, responsive heart, but a hard one. So look in verse number 7. Right at the end of verse number 7, notice it says there, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was disgusted with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray. They do not know my way, so I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. What a weird way to end the psalm. And if you think about it, the psalms are songs, by the way. They're songs that were put to music and sung in worship in the temple. So you think about this song, what a weird way to end the song. There's no resolution, it just leaves it hanging out there, and I think that's by design because he's wanting us to catch a warning, a warning from the people and the story of Israel. And this story goes back to Exodus chapter 17. Um, Israel is traveling from Egypt to the land that God had promised. They are in the desert, they are thirsty, they think that they're about to die, and so the people revolt against Moses. Do you remember this story? They revolt against Moses because of their thirst. They're like, you've led us out out here into the wilderness just to kill us by thirst. We're so thirsty, we're going to die. And this is a big deal. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have bottles of water they could carry with them. Okay? They were dependent upon water sources. They're traveling in the desert and they're like, listen, you brought us out here to die. There's no water. We're going to die of thirst. And so they revolt against Moses, and they're like, we want to kill Moses and go back to Egypt. We want to go back. We want to go back. So God tells Moses, I want you to go and strike the rock so that water will come out. Now, knowing this culture, shepherds, which Moses was, knew that there are certain places in rocks where the rainwater would gather behind the, the rock. And it was really not like a, necessarily a real rock. It was more of a facade, like a buildup, a rocky-looking buildup 
that the shepherds knew water gathered behind these areas and Moses could take his rod or his staff and he could hit that and break that facade of the rock, break it up and water would flow out of the rock in, in great gushes where people, the rainwater is flowing out. So God pointed to Moses and said, I want you to go to this spot. Here's an area where you can hit the rock and the, the water will come out. So that's what Moses does. By the way, the second time Moses got in trouble for this because Moses knew where to hit the rock because he's a shepherd. He knew how to get water for his sheep in the desert. But God didn't tell him to hit the rock. What did he tell him to do? Speak to the rock. Moses instead hit it, and he was not allowed to go into the promised land because he didn't. Why? Because he didn't bring glory to God through his obedience, right? It was all about glory. But anyway, at this moment, Moses goes and God shows him where to strike the rock to get water. The water flows out. And Moses, in Exodus 17, calls the place Masa and Meribah. Now, if you are in Psalm 95, some of your translations, especially your older ones, will not have the words Masa and Meribah. You will have the words quarreling or fighting or something like that and testing. The reason is, is because the word masa means quarreling because it was there the people quarreled, fought with Moses. And the word meribah means testing because it was there that they tested God. And what the psalmist has, or what the older translations have done is they've not, they've just, they've translated the word masa and meribah, but Moses actually gave those names or to the place there. Does everybody follow what I'm saying there? So he named it Masa and Meribah, saying it was there that they fought with God, or fought with Moses, and they tested God. And the people revealed that they didn't really trust God to provide for them. And what God says is they had done is that they had hardened their hearts against God and wanted to go back to Egypt, where they were slaves. So God, what did he do? Well, he made them wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. The whole generation died, and none of them were allowed to go into the promised land. The writer of Hebrews actually quotes this psalm to talk about this same event and to make this same point. In Hebrews chapter number 3, Verse number seven, listen what he says here. He says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked to anger with that generation and said they should always, they always, they always, they always go astray in their hearts. And they have not known my ways, so I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. And here's his point. Here's the point. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. In other words, learn from Israel's past, not to harden your heart when God calls to you. Whenever God calls to you, how does your heart respond? When God is leading you, how does your heart respond? How does, you know, like I say you, but you do realize that when I'm talking to you, it's because God's been talking to me. Like, how does, our, think, how does our heart respond when God leads? When God corrects? When God points out something in your life that's not right, how does your heart respond? Is it, is it receptive? Thank you, Lord, for showing me where I'm not right. Or is it resistant? Well, it's not that bad. I'm not that bad. And here's a good one. Well, I'm not as bad as that person. Yeah, I know I've got issues, but I mean, God, have you seen what they did? 
or what they said or how they act. What is the, and here's another way to ask it, what is the regular disposition of your heart? Is it one of responsiveness or resistance? A generation of people in Israel missed God's rest. They missed living in the land of promise because of a hard, unbelieving heart. And I'm telling you, some of us could be in danger of missing out on what God has promised because of a hard, unbelieving heart. Some of you might be in, in danger of missing the rest of God that is found only in the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. You know why? Because your obstinate, hard, resistant heart. And I don't want to be harsh. I don't. I don't. Because God loves you enough to draw you to himself. But listen to me. Listen to me. I care that you are submissive to God. God cares that you're submissive to God. And so I'm not trying to be harsh, but I am trying to give you a sense of urgency. Respond when he calls. Today, Hebrew says, is the day of salvation. You walk out of here with a hard heart, and it may be, it may be that your heart is so hard that God allows it to be hardened further, and you never again have a chance in the softness of this moment to be receptive to the gospel. You know what the scariest thing in the world is? To go to a place to where you can't say yes to Jesus anymore. It's scary. It's not because God is angry or mean or doesn't give you chances. It's because you've hardened your heart and you won't respond. And God says, if you won't respond, then I'm going to stop calling. Some of you may be missing out on the rest of God because you won't respond when God calls to you. But there are some who might be missing out on the joy of a deeper walk with Christ that comes with maturity and abiding in Him. And you know why you won't? It's because you have an, a hard, unbelieving heart. You're saved, you gave your life to Christ, but now God is wanting to lead you to a deeper level of spirituality, a deeper level of commitment, a deeper level of relationship with Him, but you just won't do it. You, you just... You just, you know that you're, you need to spend time with God every day. You know it, but you just won't do it. You know that you need to go share the gospel with somebody, but you just won't do it. We just won't do it. Why? Because we just, there's, we have a hard, unbelieving heart that we need God to soften. We need him to soften. We need him to it's just, it's a choice to be receptive. Beware of a hard, unbelieving heart. I'm just, I'm saying this to you because I don't want you to miss out. I don't, I don't, God doesn't want you to miss out. There is so much joy in walking with Jesus at a deeper level. There's so much blessing and enjoyment and just sweetness. I've said this a, a lot recently, but there's just so much sweetness and I don't want you to miss out. And the reason we'll miss out is because our hearts have become hardened to what God wants to do. So don't miss out. Listen to what 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says. And I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up right here. It says, For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. You know what wholeheartedly means? It means that their hearts, God shows himself strong to those whose hearts are are loyal to him. So, here's a question I have to ask myself. Justin, how is your heart? When, when God calls to me, how does my heart respond? How does my heart respond? When God calls to you, how does your heart respond? 
You know how you know how you know where you stand? Here's how you know where you stand, where your heart is. The disposition of your heart. Here's how you know. The way you know is how quickly you obey when God says go. The the timing of your response to God reveals the disposition of your heart. Yes, God, I see it. I'll get to that. You know, you're right. But not today. Yes, I, I, I should do that. I should, I should get baptized. But I'm just going to wait until the end of the year. Or the next year. I know I should join the church, but I'll, I'll get to it. I know I should be in a small group. I know I should. One day. Right now, I've just got a lot going on. One day. I know that I should say something to that person. Well, you know, I'll get to it. You know, it's just not the right time for me. How quickly does your heart respond when God calls? Because that will reveal the condition that your heart is in. Responsive or resistant Do not have a hard heart and miss what God wants for you.